Uh, it's good to be at the East Point Church of Christ today. It's good to be gathered with the church family because this gives me encouragement. It kind of fills my tank every week being, being here at East Point. And so I'm thankful for you all and thankful for the opportunity to speak to you this morning just briefly about something that's been on my mind all week. It's called Raiders of the Lost Soul. Now that might, you might know that to be a playoff words of Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones. Anybody ever see that movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Well, if you know a little bit about the plot, of the, if you don't know a little bit about a, the plot to that movie, I'll just tell you just briefly. Uh, Indiana, this movie's based in 1936. Indiana Jones is a professor at a college, but he's also an archaeologist, and he goes to find relics. Uh, as the movie opens up, he's in South America, he's trying to find this relic and uh, he, he, he runs away uh, from this big rock that's rolling towards him. And uh, so he gets away from that and he, he gets back to the college in America. And since it is based in 1936, um, World War II is, is briefly upon him. And so Adolf Hitler is trying to find the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, he believes in this movie that the Ark of the Covenant, if he gets the Ten Commandments out of the Ark of the Covenant, that will make his army very strong. And so the U.S. government hires Indiana Jones to find it first to prevent Adolf Hitler from finding the Ark of the Covenant. And I tell you this this morning because just like Adolf Hitler and though his army was trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, there are things that will try to find your soul and raid your soul. There are things that will try to steal you away from God and what His purpose is for us on this planet, on this earth. And I know that there are some here this morning in this building whose souls are lost. And I'm just going to ask you up front right now, why have you not made a decision for Jesus Christ? Because... If you haven't made a decision for Jesus Christ, I've got to wonder if there's something stealing or raiding your soul from following Him. And this sermon this morning, I hope, is a reminder and a renewal of what not to let happen to your soul. Because this could be a good reminder of what awaits your soul if you do not know Jesus. And that's darkness. And that's fear. And most of all, that is the not being in the presence of God. Our text this morning comes from Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 31. I encourage you to turn there if you have your Bible. I'll be in the New American Standard Version this morning, maybe a little bit different than what you're used to. But the Bible says this, Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he must die, and after three days rise again. And he was st stating the matter plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples, and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Let's go to God in prayer this morning. God, we come to you just as humbly as we know how this morning, thanking you for the opportunity to gather in this place, to preach and proclaim your word, the message, the gospel. We know that it is the good news, and there's plenty of good news in it, Father. And we know that one of these days your son is going to come with his holy angels, but until that time it is our job to go out into the world and preach the gospel like you said in the Great Commission. And Father, I pray that if there's someone here this morning who hasn't made that decision, 
for Jesus Christ that something is, is raiding their soul. Father, that you would prick them in their hearts this morning. They would make a decision to follow Jesus because now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. Father, I pray that you would use me as a tool for your word. May my words be your words. Guide and use me in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we want to talk about raiders of, of your lost soul. And this morning I'm going to bring you three points, three raiders of your soul that could possibly keep you from a relationship with Jesus Christ from following Him. As we open this message this morning, if you look to the verses previous to Mark chapter 30, Mark chapter 8 verses 31, you'll see that Jesus and His disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi and word has traveled around about Jesus and Jesus, they ask, they say, He asks His disciples, who do they say that I am? And his disciples tell him, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. Then Jesus asks his disciples a question, who have been following him this whole time, and he asks them, he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, being the most outspoken one from his disciples, says, you are the Christ. And so I must ask you this morning, who do you say that Jesus is. Is He your Lord and Savior this morning? Is He your everything? Is He your first in your life? Or is He somebody else who you just come with to worship on Sunday morning? And just put Him maybe second or third in your life. Who do you say that He is? The Bible says He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we get down in verse 31 and we see in verse 31 that Jesus, this is the first time in the book of Mark that he predicts his death. And he says that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be killed. He says he must suffer many things. Jesus is going to suffer. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be tied up and arrested. He's going to suffer many things for mine and your sake. So we could be right here this morning. And he tells his disciples this. And Peter, again, the most outspoken one, sticks his foot in his mouth. And I kind of feel like sometimes I'm Peter because I stick my foot in my mouth a lot. But thank goodness for forgiveness. So Peter takes Jesus aside. Now imagine this, Peter takes Jesus aside, over to the side, and begins to rebuke Jesus. Now think about this for a minute. How much has Jesus done in the presence of Peter already? He's healed the blind, he's fed 4,000 and 5,000, and he's done numerous things that show Peter that he is the Christ. But yet Peter says, oh Lord, I'm going to take you aside and say and rebuke you. You shouldn't be talking like that. But Jesus knows what Peter's thinking. Peter's thinking only about the things here on earth, thinking about keeping him around all the time, about him being on the throne in Jerusalem. Peter's not got his mind set on heavenly things, and i got to wonder if something is raiding your soul this morning if you are not got your mind set on earthly things and not heavenly things, just like Peter. So Peter... Sticks his foot in his mouth, and then Jesus tells him, Get behind me, Satan, because you are not thinking of God's interests, but man's. And the things that will rage your soul and keep it from following Jesus are not God's interests. The devil, who is the ruler of this world, and it says so in John chapter 12, verses 31 through 33, where the Bible says, Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and, it, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So this verse in John chapter 12 indicates that the devil is the ruler of this world. And he's going to do his best to use you for his purpose and not God's.
This right here. The devil will use this for his purpose and not God's if you don't watch out. How many times? And I'm, 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 I got a mirror in front of my face here, so if I'm talking to you all, I'm talking to me too, okay? How many times do we see this stuff in people's faces? Not talking to each other not doing the things that God wants us to do, about talking to our families about God, about using everything, His Word for His purpose, but we got this stuffed in our face. If you look at the back of it, this is an iPhone. If you look at the back of it, there's, a, there's an apple with a bite out of it. That makes me indicate and think of the Garden of Eden. I would say that cell phones and social media and television. All these things are things that will raid your soul and keep you from being close to God if you let it. But you don't have to let it. You can be closer to God. You can tell those raiders of your soul that get behind me, Satan, just like Jesus told Peter. And this morning, if you want to save your soul, you've got to take up your cross. and You've got to follow Jesus, just like he said in verse... 34 of our text this morning. Now Jesus knew what he was talking about here. Jesus knew that the form of crucifixion, the form of execution that the Romans used at this time was crucifixion. And crucifixion was hanging on a cross. This is where, this is the way Jesus would die. But if you read the story of the crucifixion, Jesus carried his cross to Calvary. And that's what Jesus is saying here this morning is that we've got to take up our cross daily and we've got to follow Him. It's going to be hard. It's going to be not going to be easy. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it will be easy because it's not. But with God's help, we can live so much better than you can not on the side of Jesus. And this, this morning, this text brings me to the first raider of the soul, and that is position. You know, many people who want to be somebody on this earth, they won't ever acknowledge God as Lord and Savior because He don't fit into their worldly way that they want to be or what they're doing. He doesn't fit in for them to be that person of high position. You know, a lot of CEOs in, in the company, in, in, in companies, a lot of them, unlike... Chick-fil-A, which is one of my favorites because they choose to close on Sunday and the CEO knows how important that is. Hobby Lobby don't open on Sundays. Those are good Christian organizations, but there are other organizations out there that only think about money. And I will tell you from my experience being a salesman in the sales industry, if you're going to sell something, it's going to be hard to be a Christian. I'll be honest with you. Because I've seen salesmen for the company that I work for get drunk and, and try to make all these deals and not be the things, not be the person that a good Christian should be because of a, some kind of position that they're trying to acquire within the company. And I will tell you this this morning. If you want to be a person somebody looks up to, then you need to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And you need to not let the worldly things come in and raid your soul. You need to be focused on heavenly things. This reminds me of the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector from Luke 18. The Pharisee and the tax collector. What was wrong with the Pharisee's prayer? Because he says, Father, I thank you that I'm not like others, that I don't do this and that I don't do that. And he's telling, you know, when in his prayer, all these things that he doesn't do. He's being self-righteous. But then the tax collector, he prays a prayer, says, he doesn't even look up when he prays his prayer. He bows his head and he beats his chest and he says, Father, forgive me, a sinner. And the text here says he went away justified. The tax collector did. Justified just if I'd never seen him. He was the one that went away not the Pharisee. The Pharisee was supposed to be a religious leader at the time and uphold the law and do the things that you would want somebody to look up to, but they were not because they would say one thing and do something else. Don't let your position of trying to be somebody here on this earth get in the way of your soul going to heaven. 
I mean, the second thing this morning that can raid your soul is possessions. I've said many times here, and I'll reiterate this again, I love cars. If I could, I'd have a driveway full, and my wife will testify to that. I just love, love automobiles, and I love vehicles. I love guitars. I just bought this brand new guitar a couple, couple months ago. But you know what? Those things don't mean a hill of beans when I'm gone. Don't mean anything. They'll still be here, and when the world is, is burned up, and when the world is gone, they'll be gone, and hopefully I'll be with Jesus Christ in heaven. That's the goal. Amen. The book of James says, James chapter 4, verse 14, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Casting Crowns has a song out, and one of the verses in it says, I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. And why do we not recognize that? Do we always think we're just always going to be around? I got told a story this week by one of my employees at work. Uh, there was a gentleman that worked for Black Hawk Mining who used to come in. And he was probably in his mid-40s. He was a greaser for one of the jobs at Black Hawk Mining. He bigger, heavier set guy came in, always wore bibbed overalls. And one of my employees tells me, says, you haven't seen this individual in a while, have you? I said, no, I haven't. He said, did you know he died? I said, what? It, it kind of caught me off guard. This gentleman was in his mid-40s. He had found out he had lung cancer, and within two weeks he was gone. Now you tell me that this life is not like a vapor in the wind here today and gone tomorrow. This man is just in his mid-40s and cancer took him out of this world. Now did he know Jesus? I don't know. But I can tell you right now that any possession that you got that's keeping you from being one of God's children this morning needs to take a second, needs to take a back seat to God because you can't take your you can't take anything with you. I can't take my cars and my guitars with me. You can't take motorcycles. You can't take golf clubs. You can't take anything with you that you love here on this earth. All that can, you can take with you is your soul. You know, people who are rich in the public eye, you think about people like Warren Buffett. You think about people like Bill Gates. All these people have money. They're well-to-do. They got a lot of stuff, man. And they live a pretty pleasurable life right now. But what do they have when, when it comes to their death? What do they have? Do they have Jesus? Do they know him as their, as their Lord and Savior? Do they know that they can have eternal life? Because I want to encourage you this morning that if you choose to obey the gospel today, then you can live this life abundantly. You can live better than you have been if you don't know Jesus because you have the assurance of eternal life. And then the third raider of the soul this morning is power. Now we all, in the, over the past few months, have seen, on the, if you've watched the news any at all, you've seen what the hunger of power can do to people. There's been so much corruption and scandals that's been, I mean, stuff we don't even know about because our government is far away from God. Our government doesn't recognize Him first, recognize Jesus first as Lord in their lives. They recognize their own self-interest because they love power. And there's power-hungry people in this world that we live in here in this community, not only in Washington. You know, last part of our text this morning in Mark, verse 38 says, we live in an adulterous and sinful generation. Do you think he was just talking about then or is he still talking about now? He's still talking about now. We still live in an adulterous and a sinful generation. And this generation is filled with people who thrive from being powerful. You know, Jesus said before his ascension into heaven and Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And, and I like the way the King James Version notes it. He says, all power is given to me 
He didn't say all power was given to you or anybody else. He said all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. And no one is more powerful than our Creator, Jesus Christ. Amen? But the last part of that verse 38 says He will be ashamed of us when He comes in the glory of His Father and His holy angels if, if we've not confessed Him. If we have been ashamed of here on earth. I'm not ashamed of him here on this earth. And I hope you're not this morning. But there may be some of you this morning. Who hasn't made that good confession. Who doesn't know. What it's like to have that life more abundantly. When your life is over. And I'm here to tell you this morning. That there's nothing that's going to last so long here on this earth. That's worth losing your soul over. But you know, there is hope this morning. There is hope for you. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul. The hope that you have in Jesus Christ, it keeps you steady. It keeps you anchored in His Word. It keeps the raiders from coming in because you know that you have a higher power that's working on your side, and you know that one of these days that you're going to be with Him in heaven, so that hope is an anchor. And I often wonder how people make it through life without it. And I hope today that if you have let something be coming you, holding you back from becoming a Christian, that it won't hinder you this day. Maybe, maybe you feel like this morning you have to take care of a few things before you can become a Christian, and I would tell you that that is further from the truth because Jesus Christ wants to walk with you right through it. He doesn't want you to go through it by yourself because He wants you to have someone that you can lean on, someone to go to through those times when it gets tough. You don't have to be perfect to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Is anybody here perfect? Raise your hand if you are. Only Jesus Christ was perfect. And thank goodness His grace and His mercy accepts us just as we are. Just as we are. He accepts us. He wants our souls to be with Him in heaven one of these days. He doesn't want us to go to a place where there's darkness and where there's fear and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He doesn't want us to go to that place. But if you've not made that confession this morning, if you've not said, you know what, Jesus, I want to put you first in my life, then I have to wonder, will you do it today? James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That last part, cover a multitude of sins. The blood of Jesus Christ can cover a multitude of sins. It doesn't matter how bad the sin, because if you walk this aisle this morning and you make that confession, Jesus Christ's blood will cover it. And it will continue to cover the sins that you might commit because we're not perfect. But we do have grace and mercy on our side. And I hope that this morning that you'll take that first step out if you haven't ever done that before. I hope you'll take that first step out and you'll come up and say, you know what, I'm tired of walking around not knowing my soul is assured with Jesus Christ. I want to know that right here this morning. The baptistry is ready. The water's warm. We want to immerse you in Christ this morning for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because we want your soul to be with Him. We don't want to let these worldly things get in, the position, the possessions, or the power. We don't want to let those things raid your soul. You know, in, the, in the movies, by you know, the Indiana Jones movies, he's always looking for something. He's always seeking the next treasure he's going to find. He's always wanting to seek the next adventure. He's always constantly looking for something. And that's the way your soul is until you find Jesus. When you find Jesus Christ and you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, it fills that spot that's been empty for such a long time. 
and it fills that spot that you know you have that assurance, you know what, it doesn't matter if I die tomorrow, I'm going to be with Jesus. Because you can have life everlasting. Because you have to lose your life here on this earth. Not physically, but spiritually. You have to lose your life spiritually here on this earth in order to gain heaven when, when Jesus Christ comes. There's a way that you can do that that's set forth in God's Word. It's called the plan of salvation. And if those of you who don't know it, I'll just go through it here. What the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing comes by the Word of God. And then after that, you've got to believe who Jesus is. In our text this morning, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that he is? Do you want to make him your Lord and Savior this morning? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then after you believe, you've got to repent because you can't keep going the same way you were going, living that life, wanting to let those raiders of your soul keep you from going to heaven. You have to make that 180 degree turn and go the other way and not look back because when Lot's wife looked back in the Old Testament, she turned to a pillar of salt. Luke 13, 3 says, unless you repent, you too will also likewise perish. And then after you repent, you've got to confess who Jesus is. Matthew 10, 32 says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. We can't be ashamed of who Jesus is because, as our text said this morning, if we are ashamed of him now, he'll be ashamed of us when he comes with his holy angels. And then after you confess... We immerse you in the watery grave of baptism. That is where you contact the blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit because Mark 16, 16 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then after you were, you're immersed, then that's when you get to walk the new life. You get to keep living for Jesus Christ. You have that assurance of where your soul is going no matter what if you died the next day. You have that assurance. Because James 1.12 and Revelation 2.10 says if we live faithfully to the end, we'll receive a crown of life. I hope this morning that someone who's tired of running from Jesus and making that decision will come. Because we're not promised tomorrow. There's a last part of a song, an old bluegrass song that I remember. The name of the song is called What Would You Give in Exchange for Your Soul? It's based off the scripture this morning. The last part of the verse of the chorus says, Oh, if today God should call you away, what would you give in exchange for your soul?